So I'm going to be talking uh, today about identity and the link between identity and sexual health. And I'll be focusing on black minority ethnic uh, men who have sex with men in the UK. So the structure of my talk is I'll begin by talking about one case study, and that's British South Asians of Religious Faith. And that's actually quite a diverse group because there are a variety of religious traditions represented in this cohort, as well as people who identify ethnically in slightly different terms. Um, I'll then go on to outline some of the identity-related issues observable in this group on the basis of research that both I've conducted and others have conducted. I'd like to then outline a theory which I think can really enable us to better understand what can challenge identity among this group in terms of the interface of sexuality, religion, ethnicity, and also how this can impact on sexual health outcomes and sexual health behaviours. I'll uh, describe uh, some of these uh, methodological points that underpin the research that I've done, and uh, then I shall try to conclude and wrap this all up with some, uh, hopefully, some, some practical implications. So the first thing to bear in mind is that we, as human beings, have multiple group memberships, and uh, in the context of the group I'm looking at, these group memberships include religious, ethnic, sexual identities. We should re remember that our identities are fluid, and they change over time. They're responsive to changes that we experience. People can go from identifying as uh, bisexual to gay um, simply because the labels may serve different purposes in different contexts. We should bear in mind that the identities that we claim, that we lay claim to, also are associated with particular norms, values, stereotypes, and that can lead us to resist some identities and to take some on. Now, my primary concern here is how identity and behavior and health can be linked together. And I hope that the theory I present will enable us to, um, to, to, to think about that in a bit more depth. Before I continue, however, to, to uh, discuss that specific point, I want to outline just very briefly some of the key identity issues um, among the cohort that I'm focusing on. And I want to start off by thinking about religion. So many British South Asians, particularly those of Pakistani background, identify as Muslim. And uh, this is often a very important identity for this cohort. It's often a lens through which the rest of the world is sort of regarded because of the importance of this identity. So it makes sense to think about what the stance on homosexuality and LGBT issues may well be within this religious tradition. The short answer is it's quite difficult to pin that down because there are so many different denominations, as with other religious groups. And religions often entwined with local cultural norms and values. But what's quite clear from the research that has been conducted is that the mainstream Islamic stance seems to be negative. And this is the message that many gay Muslims themselves take home. In order to substantiate this position, various passages from the Quran are drawn upon, particularly the story of, of Lot, as well as some hadiths, so um, testimonials of the Prophet's life, which seem to point towards the outlawing of homosexuality. However, there is a reverse discourse. There are some groups that are attempting to showcase the possibility of being Muslim and gay and Muslim LGBT uh, simultaneously. But as Yip has remarked, there are at present very limited efforts in Islamic theology which can offer non-heterosexual Muslims the resources to actually cons construct this reverse discourse, which means that some conflict may be, may be faced by individuals. Sikhs are another important group within my cohort. Uh, many Indians from North India identify as Sikh. Many cite their religion as a reason why their sexuality is problematic. But actually looking at Holy Scripture, we can see that there's no mention of LGB identities at all. This is actually very much rooted within the culture, but religions tends to be erroneously cited as a reason or a substantiation, a justification of this position. And it's a very similar story within Hindu perspectives. Hinduism does not overtly condemn um, homosexuality, um, yet some people believe that that's the case. It tends to be more cultural rather than theological in origin, homophobia. Now, I've done some work looking at how um, Muslim, Hindu, and Sikh heterosexuals think about um, homosexuality and LGB identities in order to understand the backdrop against which second-generation 
British South Asians might be constructing their sexual identities because they, of course, will construct these identities in accordance with the messages that they're exposed to within their environments. Some of, my, uh, some of the observations that have emerged from my research show stereotypes among parents that their children who um, disclose that they are um, gay or bisexual are choosing to be rebellious that their homosexuality is a Western influence, that perhaps something has gone wrong during childhood, that religious faith can heal, that this may be a test from God and that there are some, there's some divine causality there, or that Satan is trying to tempt um, what, you and therefore it's necessary to resist these temptations, and that a heterosexual marriage can put things right. So these are the sorts of messages that many people themselves are discussing, and that's the backdrop against which people are having to struggle with their identities. Now I promise to present a theory that I think can be very useful and that's identity process theory from psychology. It's a theory that specifies how we construct our sense of self, what it is that threatens identity and how we cope with these threats. The theory acknowledges that we construct identity on an ongoing basis, that it changes over time, we assimilate new things to our sense of self, we have to create room for this new information, and we have to append meaning to this new information. What does it mean to be gay, for example? What does it mean to be of religious faith? Crucially, our sense of identity is guided by various principles. We seek feelings of self-esteem, something that's already been mentioned this morning. We like to feel in control. We like to perceive ourselves as the same over time, despite the inevitability of changes that we experience. We like to perceive a sense of belonging within relevant groups. And ultimately, we like to perceive our identities as coherent, at least those traits, those aspects that we see as being connected with one another, as often religion and sexuality are. Now, this is a rather complex looking model, but it explains the theory and how when we experience threats to any of those principles, and of course, having looked at the stereotypes I presented on a previous slide, we can see how those principles may well be challenged by people believing that what you're doing is sinful. That can challenge your sense of self-esteem. Well, if your identity is threatened, you will try to, um, you will try to cope with these threats by engaging in a variety of strategies. Some are psychological, others are more interpersonal. Some are intergroup in nature. If something enhances your identity, you're likely to reinforce that behavior, to internalize it, and to sustain that behavior. So very briefly, some methodological points of the studies I want to present. So I'm going to present some quantitative data very briefly, um, drawing on a very large-scale survey study of BA, ME, MSM. And I shall also present a series of interview data, uh, st st interview studies, and the data deriving from those studies um, that tapped into the experiences and the identity experiences of the groups that I'm interested in. The first thing to bear in mind is that in thinking about the model IPT, we see evidence of various principles being threatened when people are thinking about the interface of their sexual religious identities. And some of these quotes illustrate that. By the way, when there's an M in brackets, that's referring to a Muslim respondent, S refers to a Sikh respondent, and H to a Hindu respondent. So self-esteem, I was fighting with myself when I was little. It felt so right and so damn wrong all at once. I knew my family and uh, friends and community would hate me if they knew I, I'm gay. I felt horrible about myself. We can see how the, these stereotypes and the stigma surrounding sexuality, um, sexual minorities within cultural settings can lead to uh, difficulties in deriving a positive self-conception. Self-efficacy, the, the inability to change the, what one believes to be wrong within valued group memberships, the stance that is perceived to be incompatible with sexuality. I know our religion doesn't teach homophobia, but nobody listens, there's not, not even a discussion going on, and that makes me feel really helpless. So people want to try to uh, redress this problematic reality that they observe in their groups, but feel unable to do so. And continuity, of course, uh, given that people value uh, particular relationships, they fear the breakdown of these relationships if they disclose their sexual identity to significant others, like to parents, to friends, to community members. It isn't the case that people can unproblematically depart from a group that stigmatizes them, such as one's religious group or ethnic group. These groups are often entwined with other valued groups, and therefore they're essential to people's sense of well-being. So that fear can challenge 
the sense of continuity because people are afraid of how the present will connect with the future and that disconnect that they may be unable to resolve. Belonging is an obvious one. If you feel that you will be ostracized from valued groups, your sense of belonging will be challenged. You may lose membership in key groups. A Sikh participant said, to be honest with you, now I'm totally fine with it, like relaxed and calm about who I am being gay. It's the family and culture that makes it a big issue because they're not going to accept it the way I have, are they? They basically bring me back to square one, if you get what I mean. So whilst individuals may have resolved conflict at a kind of a psychological, personal level, they do fear responses from key significant others, which can be challenging. We also um, can observe similar threats to faith identity. And this is, remember what I've said, an important identity. Self-esteem, belonging can be challenged in relation to that particular dimension of one's identity. And I, I'm mindful of time, so I won't go into depth on this, but Dominic will make available my slides. So, if, so that information is there as a resource if you, if you want it. Okay, I'll miss this out, actually. I'll go on to talk a little bit about sexual behavior and sexual health. Now, we're looking at HIV knowledge and STI knowledge and sexual practices among the cohort I'm interested in. There are some interesting observations that can be made. In quantitative research, what's observable is that HIV knowledge among British Asians seems to be considerably lower than many other groups, including other BME groups, certainly lower than the general population. There's also no significant effect of education. So it isn't the case that a South Asian uh, person on average who's more educated will necessarily know more. So there seems to be something about the social networks from which one derives this information that you know, isn't really providing much exposure. I found it quite interesting that those individuals who actually perceive themselves as being at low, as being at low risk of HIV infection um, actually possessed the uh, lowest HIV knowledge as well. But those who perceived themselves um, as having very high knowledge, actually, um, that there, were kind of, there was an erroneous risk appraisal there. So there's something that requires, that, that's something that requires some attention about how people can derive accurate risk appraisals. And it's got a lot to do with identity because our groups provide us with information. Our groups are key sources of information. Now, in looking at how people may manage risk in relation to sexual, uh, uh, to sort of sexual health, um, identity also makes its way in here. And these quotes demonstrate how identity is, is, is so relevant. So one respondent said, you know, I only get with other Asians, basically, people I know I'm comfortable with. Okay, not always people I know, but I'm into Asian guys, and I ask if they are DDF, which is an acronym for drug and disease free. So it's not that much of a problem for me. So the relevance of identity here is that we know from, a large, from, a, from many, many years that um, in-group favoritism is something that characterizes the human experience. We favor members of our own group, and we often um, associate risk without groups, with other groups. And therefore, people believing um, that their own group is very low risk may mean that they actually inadvertently start taking risks, because that's not, of course, um, always going to be correct. People also have a profile in mind about what it means to be a very risky person. Somebody who goes to sex parties or who has multiple sexual partners is necessarily higher risk. And therefore, they see themselves as being low risk. So there's this very specific understanding of what risk means within this particular group. There's a perception that HIV is not big within one's community. Some people resisted um, ideas of risk associated with the self by virtue of their disidentification with being gay, the idea that I'm not gay, therefore I'm low risk, regardless of the number of sexual partners they may have and regardless of their specific sexual practices. So it shows again how identity, that identity category, being gay, evokes particular images in people's minds. And by resisting that, they're also able to see themselves as being lower risk. Now these data show um, the particular risk-taking behaviors and the prevalence among the different groups. And we can see among South Asians, there seems to be slightly um, lower frequency of drug use, but actually a higher frequency of sauna visits than some of the other groups. And that makes sense in terms of the low levels of disclosure of sexual identity due to fear of rejection and given the threatening nature of this identity that I've described already. <coughs> 
And to substantiate this, some of the qualitative data show how people seek safe spaces for sexual encounters, such as Grindr, such as online apps, such as more anonymized settings like gay saunas, um, as opposed to perhaps going out uh, and using um, gay bars or other kinds of more social, other social environments of, the, of that kind. So one participant said, in gay saunas, you're not going to get a fake pro profile. It is what it is. Gay guys um, who are there to have sex and that's all. There was an avoidance also of gay venues of other kinds. Interestingly, and this connects with the points that have been made around chemsex, there was an observation, there's an observation to be made around substance use and escapism. People talk about getting high and engaging in chemsex as a form of escapism from the homophobia that people have faced, but also some of those racist experiences, experiences of racism that can also be very challenging for people's sense of identity. There's also some evidence of how racism and homophobia can be internalized by individuals. And this was manifest in how people talked about actually re-categorizing their ethnic identity on Grindr as other or as Latino as opposed to South Asian, given the negative stereotypes and the experiences of racism that they've encountered. How they, of course, um, dis uh, pass themselves off as, um, uh, as, as heterosexual as, a as opposed to gay um, in cultural and ethnic settings in order to avoid um, homophobia in those settings. So I'll just actually now conclude, because I know that I'm uh, running out of time. I want to just make some general recommendations and some points. Stigma around identities, all of our identities, not just one sexual identity, can constitute a barrier to positive health outcomes. It's easy to see how some of those threats to identity can escalate into mental health problems. It can see, it's easy to see how some of the coping strategies that people deploy, such as denial, such as isolation, can deprive people from social support and in, themselves become problematic in terms of mental health outcomes. It's important that we disseminate sexual health information in a way that doesn't challenge identity. We should reduce stigma around PrEP, for example. We should also accept and be more accepting of some of the practices within particular groups, which is more likely to um, lead to um, disclosure of them to relevant um, uh, practitioners. It's important also to incorporate sexual health information into faith and cultural settings. These are valued identities. They should also be settings in which sexual health and identity should be considered. It's a challenging thing to convince some faith leaders to do, but there is definitely a lot of um, room for optimism there, given that we've seen engagement around these issues within some Christian circles, for example. Sexual health screening also needs to happen in various community settings. The slide that I didn't get time to show you was that screening is quite low among um, this group. And that ties in with all sorts of issues around disclosure. What will people think if I'm seen within a gum clinic? Uh, what if I go into a community setting? Will people assume that I'm gay or that I have HIV, etc.? And there's a more general need to tackle prejudice. And we should focus not only on tackling homophobia, but also on tackling racism and prejudice on the basis of religious identities, given that people should be able to identify in the ways in which they wish to. Thank you very much indeed.